Hey everybody, in today's video we're gonna be breaking down some of the most common uh, beginner mistakes that you see the white players do against the Karo Khan, especially below uh, 1500 in Blitz, so that would be like the equivalent of uh, 1800 in uh, Rapid, so whether you're looking uh, to see how to deal with the Tartakovar variation or let's say uh, what to do against the exchange and uh, more so the advance, Please feel free to use the timestamps from the description, pick what you need, and uh, without further introduction, let's just jump right into the action. Okay, everybody, looks like we get to face an 800 rated opponent, and I'm just gonna be going for the usual stuff, and uh, we do get to see the exchange variation. So, normally this will happen from uh, d4, d5, and then ed, cd, and so on, but. What is actually very common for these lower rated games, they're gonna start with like uh, inaccurate move orders, which is <clears throat> one of the nice things about the Karokan in general is that no matter how weird they play in the opening, the character of the game remains the same and we still get uh, a very solid position and we could rely on like the typical plans usually, which is not the case when you're trying to play other openings, I would say. It's definitely much harder to adapt and... Uh, that's already enough uh, talk for the introduction about the exchange. I'm going to develop knights like this. Knights on the natural squares. Bishop hopefully to g4 in case he goes for some kind of early h3. I go on f5. And then e6, bishop, e7. I'm going to do that uh, against literally everything uh, below 1500. I think that's the safest setup. And yeah. Let's see. Now if they get to play uh, h3 with a knight on c3, it's always okay to take. So once again, I could be going bishop d6 and exchange these, it's completely fine, but I'm just gonna stick to the setup that I just recommended and not afraid of knight b5 because there is, uh, yeah, like uh, rook c8 to defend against the fork. Just gonna try to develop with every single move that I play and uh, usually when they go for long castle in the exchange variation that is just giving black like a crazy good position. Close to minus one, I believe, according to the engine. We'll have to check it in the analysis tab uh, after the game, but that would be my educated guess. Kind of. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to castle. We're going to get these uh, opposite uh, castling, which means now it's basically a race, okay? It's going to be about who's getting to opponent's king first. And I do believe in general that in these fights, uh, black should be ahead because... We already have the semi-open file to work with, and we could potentially just swing the rook over. Now, we have to deal with uh, the h3 move that's hitting our bishop, and the sort of uh, immediate reaction would be to take, which I'm pretty sure it's perfectly fine, but I'm also considering bishop f5, which would be hitting the queen, and I think it's just better because the bishop is exerting uh, pressure against the enemy. Um, King. So expecting a move like queen d2 now or queen e3, that's fine. And it would be time to develop uh, the rest of my pieces. So now a queen move, usually to a5 is pretty nice against a uh, long castle. It's just keeping an eye on the a3 pawn and putting pressure against white's king. So that's usually the way to go. Expecting a move like g4, but we can safely retreat to g6. There's like nothing wrong with that. And um, still, it's going to be pretty tricky for white to get an actual attack. They could like push the pawns, but in general, it's pretty tough for them to get any pieces next to our king, which generally makes this very safe for black. Now that they go knight h4, hitting the bishop, I could definitely autopilot play bishop g6, that's fine. Okay, perhaps I'm going to do that just because it's very simple. I just don't want to let him take and... Getting this structure. Maybe I could do bishop before and allow that. Maybe it's not that bad, you know, like knight takes, pawn takes, rook e8 ideas. I could definitely see this working, but yeah, I think for the sake of this uh, video, it might be better to just go bishop g6. Also, taking one c2. Maybe a bit crazy, but should also be mentioned, like king takes, knight b4. Maybe it's not enough, but uh, definitely you want to pay attention to surprising tactics uh, like this one. 
it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to play bishop e4, I think. Maybe knight takes, knight takes could be good, but if he doesn't take, I don't know. So yeah, after thinking for a while, I do believe bishop b4 could be top move, but I'm just going to stick with a simple play that uh, I believe you guys are probably going to find in your game. So I'll just try to make my moves in uh, such fashion that I think it's easily doable for you guys uh, that are watching. I could definitely go for more like fancy play, maybe more advanced like tricks, but... Remember, we're playing in 800 blitz, that's equivalent of like 1100 in rapid, so uh, yeah, I know you guys like these kind of videos anyway, so whatever I do, but uh, this time I'll try to make it uh, in a way that it's easier to apply in your own games, if that makes any sense, most likely not. So, queen g3, what do we do with this? Uh, I think white's wasting a little bit of time with this move, they're not really having any threats and... I see no reason why I shouldn't be placing a rook onto the open file. So I think we could use uh, both rooks. Tempted to use the f rook because maybe this one could be used on the b file. <coughs> if let's say the bishop leaves, for now bishop is covering that square. So I think I'm just going to use uh, this one as, yeah, seems unlikely to kick his bishop out. So... Just do this move, just keep the rook for defensive purposes on the king side. It's not clear like what's defending right now, but uh, you'd be surprised. A lot of the times you do need uh, that rook so your king feels uh, pretty safe. Or sometimes it's trapping your own king and you get mated. But hopefully that's not going to be the case here, okay? Let's just be optimistic. I think optimism is a great quality, not only in chess, but in life. So, yes, I know, I could become like a motivational speaker with uh, this type of instruction. Maybe it's not too late for a <laughs> career uh, change, I mean. Who knows? But for now, that bishop d3 gets played, okay. I've got almost under a minute. I need to make this in like an educational fashion, so wouldn't be like the easiest task of all time, but maybe hopefully we could pull out something. So let me actually try to think about the position. You see bishop to d3 once again, very slow. Not really creating any threats. I could really think of a move like knight b4. Hitting the pawn on a2 and hitting the bishop as well. Going like bishop takes, let's say. Pawn takes. He's gonna go a3. What am I gonna do with a knight? Oh, I think that's actually quite... Uh, could be quite instructive. There's definitely knight d4, but then bishop g6 is a bit unclear. There's definitely b5. I think b5 is one of the top moves here. I think just b5 is really top move. Okay, I'll just play b5 because I think that's going to be instructive. It's not maybe the easiest move ever, probably pretty tough. I know maybe most of you won't understand the point of this and perhaps we have the risk of you unsubscribing. I'll take that risk, okay, if you are not uh, open-minded enough uh, to watch out for these ideas. You shouldn't be watching in the first place. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. But does go for bishop takes. I'm just going to take like a good boy towards the center. What is the plan? I want to do b4. The knight moves, and then the pawn hangs. And what is the opponent doing? Gifting three pieces. What do we do with these pieces? We take. Do we calculate? Of course not. We just take, and then we look. Yeah? These pieces... I mean, these guys always invest pieces like crazy. You know? It's like Elon Musk posting a tweet about Dogecoin, and all the people invest in it thinking it's gonna go up. This is like how this 800 rated guys uh, sacrifice pieces. They think, oh, must be some kind of a tactic. But no. There's like absolutely no threat. I'm gonna go b4, mind our own business. Taking a2 next, he's got like what? Bishop h6. Wow, so scary. Threatening mate in one. We'll just play rook f7 and defend against the mate in one. I mean, there's not really that much of an alternative that we have. And okay, his knight is gonna have to move. Okay. He's gifting another knight. So I can tell you one thing, guys. If you could uh, just let's say. Take away something from this video, the queen alone is not going to be checkmating. So, just going for the bishop trade right now, making it a bit simpler. We get the rook over, threatening rook c2. He doesn't even get to see it, that's fine. Uh, and I'm going to go knight e4. Wait, do I want to do that? That's kind of fancy. That is my middle name. Uh, hmm. Okay. How about keep it simple? Let me just take. 
Just gonna be taking that. Rook does cover it. King b1, just knight a3. King is gonna be completely naked on the queen side. So, you see, guys, where I'm going with this? You've got the open file. You've got a uh, easier attack. Yeah, he goes there. So what? We don't care. Just gonna go for the discovery. Gonna take these. Discovery check. And only move seems to be queen there. That's his only move, literally. And we can just take it with the rook and I think get a checkmate. But now, I know you're probably pretty confused. Quick interruption. If you're really enjoying this kind of content, please consider liking the video because it really helps the algorithm boost the video to more people. You know that is very much appreciated, so let's just jump uh, right back into the action. You may be tempted to think that, okay, this was just luck. Um, you were lucky that he sacrificed the piece, otherwise there's no way you could have won that. Okay, you have all the right uh, to think about that. Um, in case you've been watching more than five videos on the channel, I'll give you that right. But before we jump to conclusions, uh, what better way to act like we understand chess uh, other than turning on the engine? So, I'm gonna click on this magic button and now our IQ will improve with like a thousand uh, points at least. Not sure if that's a thing, I never took an IQ test if that was not like obvious enough. And after bishop takes, pawn takes. Well, okay, actually the question is whether b5 is the first line uh, or not. Of course it's not, but... Here is the point, guys. Here's why you're watching these videos, because I'm able to show you a hidden way of chess that the computer won't understand and you can actually win games. Okay, I'm just making that shit up right now. That's not the, the reason, really. But I think it's actually a pretty strong move that shouldn't be underestimated. So let me explain you my uh, thinking process bef behind uh, b5, if there was any. So when I go b5, which is still definitely okay it's like minus three as you see it's not like a complete blunder but i'm basically calculating here okay so it's you know apparently a free pawn i'm looking okay knight b5 he cannot do that because we'll leave the a2 pawn undefended and i feel like his king is becoming very weak that's one thing that i see now if he takes with a bishop i'm thinking all right all right he does that then i could at the very least do something like knight b4 let's say which is, you know, hitting c2, hitting a2. Maybe idea is to go rook c3, queen b5. Maybe rook c3 and queen a2. That's definitely interesting. Now, that is the concrete calculation. I have to say, I haven't really paid a lot of attention to knight takes, pawn takes, and then bishop to b5, okay? That may be white's uh, best bet. However... It doesn't really matter whether they can take that pawn and not get like instantly mated because here we have a very important concept. I believe what a lot of, let's say, the lower rated players would have done here, they may want to go b5, but they will be kind of afraid of sacrificing the pawn and they would prepare it with a6 and then they go b5. Yeah? And you can see that a6, the score kind of dramatically goes down a lot, but it's not like a bad move. Trust me, you're probably going to win most of your games with this as well. If you're on the right path of pushing a6, b5, b4, um, you're definitely understanding just quite well, and I don't really know why you still keep watching this channel. But uh, the idea is, okay, we do go b5, say, in White's best dream ever, he could get away with taking on b5. Well, if you think about the position, what a lot of the beginners tend to do, they think very, in terms of, like, you know, super materialistic. They're like, oh, I lost a pawn. But if you look at the position, the fact that we lost the pawn, when is that going to matter? It's only going to matter if we get into an endgame, yeah? We get into an endgame, king and pawn endgame, you know, um, any side that has an extra pawn, 99% will win. That's just how the basic endgame theory goes. But here, since that is quite unlikely to happen, we got to focus on other factors of the position, which is more... Uh, relying on to the dynamic uh, aspect. So we've got the opposite castling, as I already said in the beginning, that's like the key factor here. And we're actually way better off without having the beep on because we're just opening way more lines against the enemy king. So the fact that we're lacking the beep on, if you look at it that way, it's an advantage. It's better than having the pawn on b7. I know 
kind of crazy, kind of a crazy concept if you think about it. So that is the main reason of why I have done that. And that's the case when they take, if they don't, well, I just won a very important tempo and I was ready to just play. I was about to play before and just get a winning attack. I mean, if you look at each position, um, there's like even material, but the computer says it's like a minus six. So it's almost like we're up two pieces. That's insane. I know, but it's just like how dominating this situation is. And just for all the doubters, I said this position after we castle and we've got the side castling should be around minus one. Okay, it's apparently minus two. So as I was saying earlier, whenever they do go for long castle against the exchange, that usually has the advantage because of this uh, semi-open file. This is super common below uh, 1500 uh, in blitz on chess.com. That would be like equivalent of like 1800 in rapid. So you really want to know how to punish these positions. It is very easy to win in general. So you don't want to be, you don't want to be missing this. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. I'm getting the black pieces and uh, you already know that uh, we're going to be sticking with the most solid opening of all time. And against the classical variation, we're definitely going to be going for the Tardak over end. Are we going to see takes? Maybe knight g3. I hope we see takes. That's like the most common move. <clears throat> Bishop d3 is common for like low rated games where you can just go queen d4 and uh, collect the free pawn. Let's see what opponent has for us. Okay, he enters the Tartak over end. I will be predicting a queen h2 checkmate, but uh, that's maybe a little bit... Uh, Ambitious. I'm just gonna start with bishop d6. Important. Our number one priority is to get castled. Typical uh, inaccuracy that I see lower rated players do. They just rush with bishop g4, which is a mistake. Just get your bishop to d6, and after bishop e2, we castle. And looks like we've got the setup with bishop e2, where if you wanna go for like the uh, let's say most accurate way of playing this bishop g4 is uh not as effective as it would be against the bishop d3 or bishop c4 line so here it would be better just to play like let's say rook e8 knight d7 knight f8 bishop f5 and so on as explained on the channel but i think if uh, if you're like let's say somewhere below 1500 and you're kind of struggling to pick up on this uh sort of subtle nuances this is your lucky day, cause you could still, uh, I think, play bishop g4 against uh, anything. I'll just start with the with the rook on the open file, just so that after bishop g4, he's gonna be more unlikely to play knight h4 or something like that. If he plays h3, of course, the idea is to step back, and in the tartar core, we never really take one f3 unless they are forced to take back with the opponent. Now we go for the typical knight d7, knight f8. Then the knight could either jump on f4 or, uh, yeah, like this, or via e6. By the way, whenever you've got the bishop on h5, don't rush with knight g6 because that could uh, get your bishop trapped. And normally they'll play something like bishop e3. Or low-rated players tend to kind of panic and play g4 in some positions like this. Yeah, okay, g4 it is, just, um, yeah, I have nothing else to do but retreating. And then I'm just gonna, like, continue with the same idea. Goes for bishop d3, so if I take... That's the, the first move that I'm calculating, because it's the most forcing. He's forced to take with a knight, only move, because if he takes with a queen, then the bishop remains undefended. So rook e1, knight e1, kind of misplacing that, but... I don't know. I think it's okay to, like, misplace the knight. I'm gonna start with that. Otherwise, he's gonna be taking himself, so... Prefer that. This is only move. Queen e1 just drops the d3 bishop, and uh, then I'm just gonna play the... Standard... Uh, knight f8. Perhaps going to e6, perhaps going to the weakened square f4. After his last move. f4 is a very weak square, because it cannot be defended by any pawns. So that's mainly because he has made that move. With the pawn on g2, he could still play g3. Goes for bishop d2, so the bishop is defended enough times. Now, I could either improve the knight or play something like queen c7. Another typical maneuver that I really want you guys to remember is bishop c7, queen d6, and just set up this super annoying battery, which I think I'm just going to do. 
you know what? Even though maybe this is not like the most accurate way of playing right now, I think it's perhaps the best educational way for you. Because you just get used to do the damn battery, okay? He's dropping the bishop. We don't care about that, okay? It's not about winning free pieces and stealing uh, some rating points. It's about showing the power of the battery, okay? Of course, in your game, you should take the free piece, of course. No questions on that, but... Just gonna let him take, and... Now we're gonna get the power of the pawn cube. I mean, pawn cube is already stronger than uh, winning a piece. Jokes aside, it is like a very good structure to have. And okay, we've got like one enemy on uh, on the king side, which is stopping us from uh, playing queen h2. So <clears throat> here I could either go rook e8 and probably just have uh, rook e1, exchange rooks and blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to a boring position. <clears throat> or I could think of g5, knight g6, trying to play like knight h4. Getting rid of his knight so we could perhaps infiltrate with a queen. So, I think objectively rook e8 is better because we're very likely to just trade rooks. He takes with the bishop and then I go queen d5, uh, which is double attack on the knight and on the pawn and that's like winning. But I'm just going to stick with this. I just want to try and highlight this idea that uh, we can actually... Uh, get rid of his knight and uh, then uh, can try to deal some damage with this uh, juicy battery that we've got. So, rookie one is expected. So far, opponent not playing that bad. Opponent playing okay. We're gonna give him that, but it, it's not gonna be easy to deal with this knight h4 move. Just uh, having so much pressure around the white king that he immediately starts running away, which is maybe clever. You know, like, running it's uh, maybe a bit of a coward move, but it's pretty healthy. So, queen d5, just go for double attack. I don't think we've got better than that at this point. Like, knight h4, takes, takes, just tunnel visioning that idea, it's probably not very healthy. But perhaps that's like easier for you to like learn this. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to try to be a good coach, guys. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you. I have to make a confession. This is hard. I'm not sure like what's more instructive here. Uh, this is really like an art right now, what we're trying to do. I think Windy 5 is like really the move. But let's stick with knight h4, okay? I'm pretty sure it's hard for like an 800 to spot such idea that the pawn on a2 is gonna be hanging and we just win it and that's gg. I think that's like pretty rough to find, so I'm just gonna do this instead. He takes, I'm gonna take back, and I'm just gonna try to be annoying. That's literally uh, what we're gonna be playing for. He's still, it's kind of annoying that he's uh, running away with a king. It's like really expecting this type of attack, but it is so strong that even when he's running, it's not going to be enough, hopefully. Just hoping that. I'm not sure yet, but hopefully that's uh, how this is going to play out. Now, it's going to be hard to actually get to this point because he has an easy way to defend. But he's just running away. I told you. Maybe looking like a coward, but quite healthy. He's not getting mated, so we could learn something from this guy for sure. Um, and yeah, I could just do queen d5, could do like queen e6 check and just win that pawn. That's like once again so easy. I really feel like I've got to, I've got to stick with that. But I'm kind of tempted to play queen h2. Queen there. Maybe check him. Yeah, I think now it's like getting pretty, pretty tricky. Okay, I think I'll try something interesting. I'll try to open up the position because that is usually the main rule that you want to know when he's like king is caught in the middle. So still here we've got like so many other better moves than this, but I think the rule is quite instructive. Whenever your opponent's king is sort of caught in the middle, you open up the position, you've got a way easier time to creating threats against his king and uh, probably get to uh, 
I have a winning attack. So I'm going to do c5 just trying to open up the central files now that he's trying to run away. King d1. Yeah, they can just take. I'm going to take once, and if he takes, if I go queen takes, the bishop will be hanging. So don't forget about the bishop, guys. If there is something that you can take away from this video, please stop hanging your bishops. And let's just go bishop b6. Creating another threat on uh, d4 and making that piece safe. And look at what white has been doing for like the past like 10 moves. He's just been running away with a king. <laughs> I think that's, uh, you know. As someone that has never played the Karokan before, that's like a big fan of the channel and just watching anyways, because for some weird reason you've got nothing better to do and just hang out with me. This would look like a fun game for me to maybe pick up the Karokan and try out the Tartak over. So look at what White has been doing. I mean, our king is chilling. Like this king retired early, okay? This king definitely retired in his, like, 20s. But, like, these pawns, so safe. The king has not been bothered in, like, ages. Look at the enemy white king. That is, like, absolutely brutal, you know? You know, they, they say chess does not affect, like, your mental health. This is exactly, like, what chess is doing to your mental health. Look at the D1 king. That's That looks like... A king that's been like playing professional chess for like over a decade. That's like just cannot handle anymore. It's just like running away. It's like I had enough. Look at the king. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Opponent taking a lot of time, but probably realizing that there's no uh, way to actually save the pawn on d4. So it just goes rook e3. That's a subtle move that will be hard for me to understand, but I guess the idea is that he's trying to pin me, which I'm not going to allow. I'm going to take with a queen. All right, let's see what's happening. So rook d3. Don't play queen e4 because you lose. That allows rook d8, and uh, because of the check, you've got to do something, and then he picks up your queen. But that's like a hanging pawn that's sort of waiting for us to be taken. Everything is defended, so... There's nothing you need to worry about yet. And Queen F1 almost looks like a checkmate. There's Bishop E1. But then Bishop A5. That should just be collecting everything. And once again, I would like to really look at the contrast between both kings. Our king is the safest king of all time. One of the nicest things about uh, playing the Tartak over and uh, another reason why as a beginner specifically... The Karokan is so much of a better opening than anything else. Beginners, really, I'll just play this move so we can cut him in kind of a mating net. So so for beginners, usually they really struggle with their king states. They just play some random like f6 early or just weaken their king and they get mated. It is just very hard to get mated in the Tardag over no matter like how bad you are, you are with it. I would just give it like so many extra points for uh, for safety. I think that's just like an uh, S tier opening. And uh, by the way, guys, this is an idea that I had a while ago. Uh, did not end up doing it, but if you want like a tier list for openings, I think you could let me know in the comments. Maybe that could be something interesting. There's like already many tier lists out there uh, perhaps even made by uh, smarter people than uh, myself but i don't know maybe you guys could have fun watching some tier list and uh, i'm predicting queen f1 checkmate after the rook d8 move so we could exchange yeah perhaps that's like maybe more instructive to play I'll try to show you how to win the end game but I think just rook d8, switching and uh, highlighting why it was so important to play c5 earlier and open up the position so we can take advantage of white's king uh, that's caught in the middle. That he's simply gonna defend the bishop now somehow, and then we just get queen f1 checkmate because the bishop is pinned and can no longer play uh, bishop e1 because of this pressure. So, uh, are you looking for uh, easy wins with black? I don't think uh, it can get easier than that. So with that, uh, we just get a checkmate and uh, I think we can uh, move on to the Halloween game. All right, all right, all right. Looks like we're getting the black pieces against an 
800 rated opponent. And already we see a bit of a sideline with knight f3 not stepping in the center immediately. But we are very likely to either see something like e takes d getting back into the exchange variation or exactly what he plays which is a signal that uh, we're going to get some kind of an uh, advanced Karo structure where there's definitely nothing wrong with c5 knight c6 doing the usual thing against the advanced but i think even slightly more accurate is to start with a pin by going bishop to g4 and of course in case we get to face something like h3 we're going to be taking the knight because uh, the rule that we're using against the advances to always uh, take on f3 and after d4 here it's a very common uh, spot where i notice a lot of people go wrong because they really want to get uh, back into let's say like the standard advance lines but they do it in the wrong fashion by playing c5 here there is absolutely no need to play c5 allowing some dc5 idea when you can just play e6 and you can go c5 on the very next move without having to sacrifice a pawn. So I just like to stick with that and then play knight e6. And we're most likely gonna get back into the standard variations. So uh, just waiting to see what my opponent is gonna do. As I already announced against h3, we're gonna take all the time uh, versus the advance and uh, striking in the center with c5 idea to go for um, knight c6 on the very next move in case we see captures we could still play knight c6 hitting g5 but i will just uh go for the simple uh bishop recapture and uh yeah just um uh, gonna stick with that another move that's expected here it is usually c3 but after knight e6 already the pawn on d4 feels uh pretty weak so uh, yeah, he does that. I could definitely start by taking, which uh, perhaps I'm gonna do. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's perhaps a slight inaccuracy to take one d4 unforced, but I just want to do it so we can get into this uh, very typical structure for uh, our repertoire. And yeah, just gonna start with the knight. Then, what you really want to understand in this whole structure is that the main battle goes around the d4 square. And because we cannot play uh, knight f6, since the pawn covers that, we have to develop the knight uh, somewhere else. Usually knight h6 allowing bishop takes and doubling the pawns is not ideal. Therefore, the only decent option remains getting the knight towards f5, which is quite nice since it's hitting d4. And before we go, just... Uh, don't play f6 in these positions that's like a common mistake that i see a lot of lower rated players do only strike with f6 let's say if you have finished development and you castled with these pieces uh not developed f6 is usually uh super risky in this position perhaps it's not that bad but most of the times it is just uh really really terrible I'm just gonna stick with the simple move getting the knight uh towards uh, f5 by the way Sometimes when you don't have that square, like for instance, if we get to see a move like uh, bishop to d3, which would be interesting not letting me knight f5 because of bishop takes. I was about to say that uh, this knight could also maneuver via c8, b6, and then like bishop e7 castle. Because some people actually get, may get stuck with this knight and they don't really know how to finish development. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, okay, on bishop b5, this is most likely... Uh, gonna lead to bishop takes knight takes so just gonna play a6 grab a bit of space on the queen side while uh, asking my opponent to see what he wants to do he takes in case of bishop to a4 we had the option of uh, also going b5 the check is a move but after knight c3 it's not that clear whether that is good or not because it's covering the bishop so it's not winning a piece and um, after this i think just a very simple play Bishop e7, uh, castle, you don't have to do anything complicated here, it's just a typical sort of even outcome, which you're gonna get a lot. Already we see that uh, my opponent makes a bit of an unforced error because he's going knight e2, while uh, leaving this knight kind of uncontested on the c file. Uh, so my knight is more active, his knight is kind of passive, so he was for sure supposed to do knight c3. Typical uh, beginner mistake. Uh, yeah, Rook c8, thinking to play. Now, with his last move, by the way, this is something that you really want to do constantly. Whenever you play, 
you want to at least spend a couple of seconds wondering uh, what's the point behind your opponent's last move, okay? Sometimes these guys, okay, there's been like a comment asking uh, me to like explain what my opponents are doing, like why am I, am I not explaining their idea and this kind of stuff. Sometimes it's hard to guess ideas of 800 uh, rated players and... You know, I'm not like saying that in a bad way, but it's simply tough. You may not have an idea or, you know, so you don't need to like overthink that too much. But you just want to spend like half a second there. And if you do that, I think you can sort of recognize that there is a threat of bishop h6 where sort of the only move would be g6, which is uh, dropping the exchange. So because you know that, you can just play something like king h8, just a prophylactic move. Okay. Rook 8 was an alternative, so against the bishop move, you could play g6 or bishop back. But I think uh, easier is just to sidestep that. We're just trying to stick with simple moves. And okay, what next? Very simple moves, no brainer. We see open file, place rook on the open file. Open file or semi open files, yeah, the side where let's say you've got no pawns, but your opponent has a pawn. Those are also good places for the rook. Now we could do b5. However, there is b4 and maybe not very easy to follow up. So I think I'm just going to start this by playing knight a5, directly heading towards c4. Okay, we're just going for the standard counter play on the queen side. And yeah, it's not that easy to stop knight c4. Perhaps the only way to do so would be knight e2, where I don't really mind the trade. We could go for um, knight c4 and just. Um, Play for the yeah, slight edge that we have because we already have pressure on the open file since uh, white doesn't have a rook there. So already a bit of a difficult position. A3 was quite a mysterious move, I would say. Rook C1 was kind of mandatory. Always put your rooks uh, on the open files. If there is something you can take away from this video, that's it. So... CB3 now, that's just kind of gifting a free pawn, and then Rook B1, I could just go back and uh, keep the material advantage. So I think I'll probably do that. I wish I could play something more instructive, but I hope perhaps I can show you to win, uh, how to win with the extra pawn, and maybe you could learn something from it. We'll see though. Hmm. Could think of knight c4 ideas next, or rook c3 infiltrating, yeah, so bishop d2. I could play knight c4 now, do we mind uh, rook takes on b7? I guess we kind of do, so I'm just going to start with b5, since there's no rush with uh, knight c4, as the knight is already defended by the queen. You want to keep that in mind, and uh, what b5 does, it's also kind of fixing this... Uh, Somewhat weak pawn on uh, a3, and we could play knight c4, just attacking the pawn on a3 twice, which is gonna be pretty tough to defend. Already the position is like technically winning, but what do you want to do? You want to avoid as little counterplay as possible. So perhaps whenever you get into this uh, type of scenario, let's say the very next game that you play, your goal shouldn't necessarily be to win it. I think you could do this small exercise and uh, try to allow as little counterplay as you can. So you see, like, your opponent wants to do a threat, just defend against that, just play it slow, exchange all the pieces, get it into the end game. So I think that's a pretty nice way to practice your technique. Yeah, just not, like, really caring about a win, like, at all, but just trying to get it in a very sort of effortless fashion without having to risk anything. So here, of course, very tempting would be rook c3 infiltrating, uh, but um, yeah, hitting the pawn and putting pressure onto these pieces. But uh, just going to stick with a very simple move, knight c4. There's like a knight takes uh, on a3 idea. By the way, we're playing five minutes and uh, we do get five seconds uh, increment uh, each move. So... I'm already into like a massive uh, time scramble and that's a time that I quite recommend you to play if you're like, let's say, okay uh, in blitz. Like sort of the main idea when figuring out what time control is best for you is whether you have to worry about the clock every single move. Yeah, if you just like, since you played move one, e4, you're like worried that you're going to flag. Probably that's not the time control for you. But uh, if you're like, um, let's say, 
usually you are left with uh, 10 minutes after uh, move 20. I think that's a very reasonable game. So probably five, uh, 5 could be a good time corner for you. If that's like too fast, definitely I wouldn't play it when you cannot like think enough. I would just stick to a longer time, like either 10 minutes, no increment or like 10 minutes and uh, 5 seconds. So when it just goes rook fd1, there is definitely a pawn that's waiting there to be taken. So how do we take? I think, uh, well, we want to allow as little card play as we can. So I think I'm just going to go uh, with a queen. And the point is when he goes rook a1, which is perhaps trying to win the pawn on a6, I'll try to keep the d1 rook under attack. So I'm gonna play queen b3, saying, all right, if you wanna take, you'll have to give me the rook. I think that's, uh, well, not necessarily a fair trade, but life is not fair. So we're just gonna do that. And he plays rook e1. Okay, that's interesting. I could just play a5. And then that's like solving the issue of the a pawn, but on the other hand, weakening b5. So there's still like rook d1, maybe queen c3. That queen c3 move is like really okay there. Yeah, just gonna do that. You use like the same mechanism. Perhaps I kind of half blundered uh, rook there. Okay, so he's going queen h4. Let's watch out. So he wants to do knight g5. That's like, I think, clear indication. Everybody can spot that. So I'm just gonna do queen d3. That's like just sort of defending in advance. Just make sure you don't blunder that, okay? If there is one thing you've gotta watch out for in this game, there's knight g5 and queen takes on h7 mate. So I'm just going to get ready with a queen. He does that. And I think we can just play a move like h6 or even king g8 because h6 does not have a threat. I spotted that in the first place, but was thinking maybe there is like um, a way that could be useful. So I'm just going to do this. Idea is to play h6 and get rid of the annoying knight. So my queen is covering uh, this critical square in a very, you know, important fashion. So the queen definitely doing a lot of work right now. And in case he attacks my queen, you just want to move it on the same diagonal. So my way to go will be queen g6 in case of rook d1, let's say. So yeah, he does that. I'm just gonna... I think now a clean sort of conversion will be just kind of bothering my opponent with the queen trade. I don't think queen f5 was necessarily the most precise. I think h6 was nothing wrong with it. He would have probably sacked the knight, but I don't think that would have been any dangerous. But I just want to... Yeah sort of uh, stress you out about this idea of always exchanging queens, especially when you've got like two connected passers, even a pawn is most of the times enough. So yeah, now, okay, he's got annoying knight. What do we do with annoying knight? We get rid of the annoying knight. Very simple, okay? Anybody can play chess like that, okay? Knight moves, okay, we've got fast pawns. We push this. B4 or A4, both would have been fine. Will he do knight h4? Then we'll have to move the queen, probably try to again stress him out with the queen trade. Now he actually has no way to move the queen because the knight will drop. So this is super technical right now. Just forcing the queens off and with that, I think all the chances of us losing the game are gone. The only way he could perhaps get any kind of plays, maybe he could get something against our king. Without the queens, that's not gonna be the case. So... Okay, he's attacking the pawn on g5. Now, we could try to defend, but f6, pawn takes, pawn takes, allows rook e6. So perhaps it's time to give up on that comrade on the king side and just uh, focus on our stronger side right now. Look at this beautiful pawn. These are just amazing pawns. Okay, time to get rid of his rook with knight b6. Then play uh, a4. Okay, just push. He's gonna get that, we don't mind. Oh, he's going knight there. Fine. I mean, let's just exchange. Uh, trading knights when we can get like three connected passers. That is definitely a good position for us, okay? He's attacking the pawn. I'm just gonna defend, okay? I'm just gonna play like a good boy and do nothing uh, fancy here. Uh, there is b3, there is c3 as well. Obviously, both are completely winning. Um, good push a3. I think I'll start with this pawn, just threatening a deadly fork. Rook a3, b2 wins, rook b1, c2. Yeah, b2. 
Pawns are literally unstoppable. If he takes on C3, we exchange a pair of rooks and then promotion square is uh, open for us. Yeah, rook there. Just C2. Giving up on this because we're going to get a queen. So um, we have to give up uh, a little bit of something, but for a full queen, I mean, come on, guys. For a full queen, that's definitely worth it, okay? That's a free rook that we take. Then I just want to exchange his last piece, the rook. Okay, he just resigns and... Uh, <clears throat> I think we managed to get a pretty clean win. I uh, wasn't necessarily tryharding in this game. So I just wanted to play easier moves in general. But I think we should get a pretty decent score. Yeah, 87. So... About this game... What can I mention? As I was saying, like, I don't think CD4 was, like, the most precise if we check it with the computer. Yeah, it definitely felt like knight c6 right away is the move, just to put pressure on d4. But even this was definitely reasonable. 97. Okay, this is interesting that uh, the computer recommends bishop b4 in this specific spot. That is not what we usually play, but uh, perhaps here it could make sense, because after knight c3, queen a5... Yeah, that's the important move. There's not an easy way for them to defend because the bishop cannot move since they will drop d4. And rook c1 runs into queen a2 because of the pin. So that would have been uh, <clears throat> a computerish way to exploit uh, white's play. You don't need to play like a, like a computer though. You just need to get these sort of fine positions and when they play queen g3... Make sure to sidestep any potential uh, bishop h6. Yeah, that's like the biggest uh, risk that you have. And then just go for like the typical uh, queen side play. See, just uh, how, how many moves did, did it take? Like we just got our thematic development and one aggressive move that we play already that wins the game. Basically, this is the only thing that you need to do in 800 rated game. Just make sure... Get a fine opening, yeah, like, no huge weaknesses. Try to stay as solid as you can. And then, once you have castled and so on, you try to focus on your stronger side, yeah? Important here, don't play stuff like f6. Even though that could be reasonable here, it's just uh, not necessary. See, already, inaccuracy. There you go, you get your um, question mark. So, uh, yeah, in Karo Khan in general, you shouldn't have that issue of like really focusing on f6 and when to play, when not to, because we usually focus on the queen side. That's like the whole Karo Khan gameplay. Get a safe king, focus on the queen side, yeah? Just for those of you that are wondering, I'm talking about this uh, orange uh, little area of the board, yeah? That's where you want to focus. Either minority attack, either like knight a5, c4. There you go. Uh, <clears throat> okay, 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 so with that I think uh, we can move on to the following game. Okay, everybody, it looks like we're getting to face a 1,000 uh, rated opponent, and this is probably the highest rated uh, person that uh, we get to face in the rating climb so far, and let's see what he's got in store for us. Seems to be going for the exchange, already knight on c3, first mistake already, a bit of a positional mistake, but... Uh, already whenever you see this move, it's a sign that your opponent's completely clueless against the Karo Khan, so another nice way of uh, playing the Karo in lower rated games. Now, I'm just going to develop the knights uh, like this, once again, just knights on the natural squares. Bishop goes on to g4, yeah, we'll try to do that immediately since it's covered by the knight. We're happy to see f3 since that is um, mostly weakening uh, white's position, like this diagonal specifically, and the knight doesn't have the... Uh, natural square. I'm just gonna, you know, maybe actually it makes more sense to go to f5. I'm actually sort of hating myself for not going there because it's clearly more active and there's no reason to keep the bishop on h5. Not a big mistake though. Opponent takes and uh, I think you've got a choice here. Normally I'd be pre-moving uh, g takes, but just for the sake of the video, I think I'll try to keep it more of like a tartar cover structure because i don't think he's that bad and when he plays queen e2 check we've got a choice between bishop e7 which we will probably play and queen e7 going for the end game now because i've got the double pawns um 
he's got uh, a majority on the queen side, so he's got like uh, four, if I can count correctly, against three, which is gonna give him a little bit of an edge in the end game. So we'll try to compensate with some dynamics and play bishop e7, keep the queens on the board. Short castle, we don't really care about uh, any sort of weird play that he can do. We're just gonna get castles. If knight f4, we always have bishop g6. So I think we'll start with uh, this little idea. Not really because uh, knight f4 was that threatening, but usually the bishop does not stay on e7 for very long. He was just staying there because we had to block the check, but the bishop ideally stays in this structure in the Tartak board. I know it's the weirdest Tartak board of all time, but, uh, well, looks like uh, still it's a very thematic possession. Rook to d1. Now, rook to e8. You can't go wrong with that move, so I'll play it instantly and think later. And now the question is, okay, we've got a pretty good position. We've got to develop the queen. Where do we develop the queen? I know b6 would be pretty tempting. Healing b2, putting pressure on d4. However, I think after b3 is not very clear what to do. And therefore, I'm more inclined to go like queen c7. We could do queen d7 as well, maybe keeping an eye on uh, g4. Perhaps having ideas of h5. Yeah, I think we'll just uh, play the move queen to d7. If opponent uh, is not doing anything crazy, yeah, I was about to say we could double up or trade, play rook e8 and even go for the end game. I think the end game is not bad, but now that we've got a bit of a target on g4, I think we can try to use the h pawn to do that. f5 trying to trade off the double pawn is also quite logical, but... Uh, it will sort of restrict queen's potential because, for instance, in a lot of lines, the queen is watching the knight after the pawn move. So I think we prefer the h pawn. And okay, if he takes, just giving us the open file for free, that is definitely something okay for us. And once again, knight f4 does not really make any real threat. So we can just pursue with our simple move. That's why we have played h5, so we can take on g4 and okay, just recapture the piece. And uh, we want a pawn. His king is very weak. Definitely, we just got a winning position, and uh, as you can see, I'm not like playing any kind of high level chess, I'm just developing the pieces on the squares where I told you in the beginning, kind of against anything. And then I'm just trying to sort of uh, teach you how to spot like the main weakness, how to potentially exploit it, and take three pawns in one move. That's how we roll. Okay, I think now that we're up material, we should be seeking for a queen trade. How do we find a queen trade? Okay, if we can get our queen to e3, that will exchange queens. We can't do it directly because that will lead to a both is gambit. So it's better to do bishop f4. And that is just preparing this queen e3 idea. So he takes as expected. Just gonna give the check. We get a uh, queen trade and we also get a bit of a jackpot because we win uh, a pawn, you know in uh, as a reward you know like the the chess gods are kind of rewarding us here that we're following good strategy and the fact that the opponent has literally one minute extra compared to what he began with but king f3 just do the same strategy exchange get it into the king and pawn end game bring your king towards the center and we've got already two extra pawns so that already speaks for itself i'll just try to kind of uh Keep an eye on the enemy king. Yeah, I can play c5, d4, ex expand. I'll just take to show you that. Okay, now we just time to push. These pawns are just like kind of canceling each other and we've got a huge lead on the other side of the board. So I'm just going to be pushing. Yeah, I'll try to uh, stay very active with my king as well. Play king e4. Yeah, now we're just about shouldering the enemy king. Let's uh, fix this pawn. White literally has no counterplay because all these squares are taken by my pawns, so he ain't going anywhere. King e3 now. I don't know why I play g5, by the way, that was not required. I'm just gonna like promote and 
Hopefully we can get to show like a rook checkmate. Hopefully that will be somewhat instructive. Guys, you'd be surprised how many players uh, below 1000 in blitz are really struggling with the rook checkmate and the king. That's like pretty funny. Okay, hopefully opponent won the rage quit now. Because 7 minutes will be a pretty long wait, but... Uh, I guess we'll see. <laughs> that would be like, imagine this guy just kind of like removing the whole game. So whenever he's losing, he could just make uh, his opponent's life as miserable as he can, you know, just like... Okay, I'm just gonna like report. Yeah, his internet is dropping. He's clearly just uh, left. I'll just try to report him and hopefully... Can do him from sexual harassment. <laughs> Uh, okay, stalling. Send a stalling report. Yeah, okay, see? When you see a stalling report, apparently we just won immediately. It's something new that I sort of recently found out about myself. So when you feel like your opponent is doing this kind of dirty behavior, uh, I think you can report him from stalling. And if he's offline, I think he kind of gets to lose the game automatically. So do you see that this guy... Uh, did exactly that, and uh, once I did it, uh, we managed to get the win, so anything interesting about this game? Nothing really, his opening was really not ideal, I just developed like uh, anybody would have. Bishop h5, yeah, as I was saying, like bishop f5 would be more precise, not like a huge difference. Uh, okay, here apparently taking with a pawn, the e pawn is even better than... Uh, and I initially wanted, and uh, if you play queen e7, the position's about even. If you play bishop e7, it's minus one, so definitely the good call there. And uh, okay, rook e8. Now, sort of only move that I really spent time on was queen d 7 which was apparently reasonable with this idea of uh, just going h5 and highlighting the over uh, extended pawns. So then the rest was pretty simple. I literally had to do nothing and yourself you won't have to do much just to win these games remember stay solid play the Karo Khan and uh there'll be nothing to stop you unless you get to face me on a rating climb account <laughs>